So, guys, tonight is our last class in the book. Oh, can you believe it? This is our last class in the book, The Foundations of Christian Doctrine. And as you guys know, we have shifted um, in the house to what? Multiplying and discipleship. And so I have a very, very, very important announcement that I need to make to you guys about this new series that we are about to embark upon. Have you guys heard of the Text to Church app? Yes. All right. So in the Text to Church app, we want you guys to register for the, um, the Multiply series, okay? Because we want to have a, a head count. We want to have an idea of space, et cetera, because this is going to be a really, really exciting book, and it's going to really help us in the area of um, discipleship. We've been learning a lot about the foundations of Christian doctrine, and I thought it was so purposeful how God has situated us to, first of all, learn the foundational tenets of the faith, to then now go forth and, one, be a disciple, and to build disciples. And so the book both multiplied me by Francis Chan. Here's the book, just in case you guys um, need a copy <coughs> of the book. Here it is. There's No, we don't have any hard copies. But there is a PDF version available. Um, I'm sure Mr. Chan would not want us to infringe upon um, any copyrights, but there is a free PDF available online of this book. Okay? I would recommend that you purchase the book on Amazon so that we can support the author. But, you know, there is a free copy out there, too. All right? Um, we will also have a syllabus that will accompany this book. Um, Apostle has the vision of us maneuvering to more of a collegial environment. Yes. Yes. And so that is, you know, right up my alley. I, I appreciate collegiality. And so we will have a syllabus that will be associated with this book. OK, um, Myra will have hard copies of the syllabus tonight, but you can also get hard copies from the text to church app. Now, I don't want you guys to feel um, intimidated or like, oh, my God, the structure of Bible study is changing and you know, no longer can I just come and sit and be motivated and leave, right? Because we're charged to do what? Build the kingdom, to make disciples. And in order for us to be disciples, we must first be a student. And so we're trying to increase the nature of being a student, okay? And there's a level of excellence that God honors as we move forward with understanding him, okay? So please take your syllabus. It'll have all of your session, out of all of the outcomes. <clears throat> It'll have all of your anticipated goals, et cetera. It'll give you an overview of the book. Because one day, Abba's House is going to be a certified ministry where people can come here to get certificates. Yes? All right, clap it up for that. So y'all got to flow. Y'all got a dream. You got to be prophetic, you know? So we got to move from the now into the future. Because we have um, a lot of great things going on here. And I don't think we really understand the depth and the breadth of what it is that we're learning until we're able to compare it, right? If this is your only church, then this is all you know. But if this is not your only church, then you know what we're getting here is really good and worthy of being shared because we literally do preach the gospel, right? We preach Jesus. You know, Moses parted the Red Sea. Okay, what's next, right? But do we understand the person is of Christ? Do we understand why Christ was sent here? Do we understand who he is? Do we understand his work? We have to be able to know that. Hence, we've arrived at where we are tonight with the doctrine of Christ and the doctrine of atonement. So before I begin, I want to pray. Father, we thank you for this moment, God. We thank you for another opportunity to learn more of you, God. It is indeed an honor. It is a privilege to just sit at your feet, oh God, to learn more of who you are. Father God, we pray for deeper understanding, deeper revelation in the things of God in you, oh Father, so that we can be better disciples, so that we can be better Christ followers. And God, we're just so appreciative that you have called each and every one of us to this moment. It is not by happenstance, God, that we're here, but you have purpose for us to be here to learn more about you. God, as we learn more about you, give us a desire, oh God, to spread your knowledge. May we be God, your hands and feet in the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so tonight we're going to do our last two chapters of the book, The Foundation of Christian Doctrine. Have you been enjoying these sessions? Yes. yes. Have this book, has this book changed your life? Yes? Raise your hand if the book changed your life. Raise your hand if the book has changed your perspective of, of Christianity and what it is that we believe, right? Um, I am appreciative that 
I uh, have the opportunity to do this every Tuesday because it takes a level of prep. And as I'm preparing, I'm learning. And y'all listen to me. What I've learned has been life changing for me. Like it ain't just changed my perspective. Like it has literally changed my life. It has changed the way I worship because the more, the more we know about God, the more intimate our worship becomes. Because it's impossible to learn more about him and not worship him even deeper. And we really worship God of our level of revelation of who he is. And I think as we, for me, as I was reading and studying this material, I realized that my revelation of who God is is deepening. And it forces a different response. As I was putting together the presentation for the doctrine of Christ, y'all listen to me. And it's like I always knew this, but when I was putting it in the presentation, I was just like, whoa. Like it made sense when you really sat down and really read the information and began to internalize what it really meant when he sent Jesus. And what was really on his mind and how masterful he was to have the father and the son present with him before the creation of the earth because he knew all things. So he created the answer before he created the earth. Before he created us, he already had the answer. Like, y'all, that, that has to be a skillful, all-knowing God. To know that I need the Father, to know that I need the Son, and to know that I need the Holy Spirit to finish this thing. Before he made us, he knew we was going to be uh, making an, uh, an error. He knew we were going to sin before he created us. And he had the answer already. Before creation, like y'all, that's powerful. And it speaks to him being all-knowing because he's God, so he could have just been God. But he knew that man was going to sin, so he made the son. And he knew that the son was going to die so he made the Holy Spirit all in one. He's outside of all of this. So if we ever have any doubt that he knows all things, just look at what he created before he created anything. The answer was in his initial creation. As a matter of fact, I retract my statement. His answer existed. Because God was not created. But the answer existed in him. And he knew it needed to exist in him. So that's pretty deep to me. I was like, all right, God. Okay, so the journey. Where have we been? We've talked through the, uh, the, the Christian doctrine, the doctrine of revelation, the doctrine of scripture, the doctrine of God. The doctrine of Holy Spirit, the doctrine of angels, the doctrine of Satan and demonology, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of sin. And tonight we're going to do the doctrine of Christ and then the doctrine of atonement. That is a lot of doctrines. That is a lot of information that we've had to digest. So it is imperative that you have some form of study life. Amen. Because it is too much information for you to digest at Bible study and don't pick it up again. And it's almost low-key disrespectful to not study it. Because if you don't study it, it's just telling God, I don't want to know more of you. And then we begin to look like, why are they weeping and I don't feel it? They're weeping because they have a different revelation than you have, because they pursued and you haven't. So we have to become students, because it is just literally too much information. And as you guys start to, with your small groups, and as you start to build disciples in your community, people will need this information, okay? You have to kind of know Holy Spirit. You have to know the doctrine of God. You got to know the doctrine of Satan and demonology. You just got to know that. You got to be able to tell people that you have angels assigned to you. And what does that mean? Because it helps to reduce anxiety. 
and it helps to reduce stress. And for a new convert, the first thing you need to tell them is that you're going to be all right. And then be able to back it up scripturally as to why you know that they're going to be all right. Because people need that assurance that this is the answer, that this is the way. I spend more time at work being a pastor than I do being a principal. I really do. Because people are hurting, people are desperate, people are sick, people are tired, people are exhausted, people are suicidal, people just don't know. And they so desperately want the answer. So I have to be able to articulate what it is I'm offering. Because if I'm not able to articulate what I'm offering, then they'll start to submit to me. Because then they'll, they'll like what I'm saying. You understand what I'm saying? And so I have to be like Jesus and say, it really ain't me. Like the, and this is the God of the truth. I had a staff member last night. She went through her little spill. She gave me the tightest hug, and she cried in my arms for about 10 minutes. And I said, the same way you're, you're hugging me and the same way you're crying to me, hug God tonight and cry to him. Because I'm not the answer, or, and I'm not your comfort. He is. You understand that? And so I want you guys to be very cognizant of that as you are discipling, the, to don't point people to you, especially when they're desperate. They just want to cling on to something. And you have to be like the angels did. Don't worship me, worship him. And that's very important for a Christian therapist. Because people just want to know it's going to be all right. And if you're that voice for them, point them back to Jesus, okay? All right, so I always like to start to build this foundation before we say anything else because this is the gist of everything that we're doing from the foundation of Christian doctrine to the multiply by Francis Chan. Chan. It is necessary that Christians be taught what kind of doctrine? Sound, what kind of doctrine? Biblical doctrine. And that all doctrine be tested by the full context of the infallible word of God. Doctrine received, doctrine believed, and doctrine practiced determines a person's character, it determines a person's behavior, and it determines a person's ultimate what? Destiny. So it is necessary before we disciple anybody, that we understand this. Because you have to give sound biblical doctrine. And when you're discipling and you're asked a question and you don't know the answer, say, I don't know. I will research it and get right back to you. Because if you tell them something that's wrong or in error, it produces character that's in error. It produces a behavior that's in error, and it ultimately will lead them to the wrong place because all of this ultimately impacts our destiny. Yes? And it's a lot of stuff out there, guys, if you've been reading the books. It's a lot of theories. It's a lot of um, opinions. It's a lot that opposes God. And here's the reality. It's a lot that's opposing that sounds good. So you have to be able to what? Test it by the full context. Not just a piece of it, but by the full context of the Bible. The Bible is not just a book. We got to cement that. It's not just a book. It is God on paper. It's powerful. It's life-changing. It is life-altering. It's not just a random book. And we have to do book on your shelf. Lord, my son. So Titus 1 and 9 says, proclaims he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke to those who contradict it. But as for you, teach what accords with what? Sound doctrine. Everything that you teach, every disciple moment should go back to scripture. Why? 
Why is this all necessary? Again, I'm going to keep saying this because I want you guys to know that this is not just something that we're just doing in isolation. Like we're doing this to fulfill a mission. We're learning this for a purpose. There ye go, go, uh, therefore go and what? Make disciples of what? All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them um, to obey all that I have what? Commanded you. And here's the reality. A lot of people are suffering and they don't even know that he's the answer. Because we've yet to disciple it. Imagine these remote places that don't have internet, that don't have phones, and don't have the Bible app, who don't know about Jesus. Because we're, we've yet to disciple them. There are remote places in the world where we've yet to take the gospel. Baltimore needs the gospel. We was talking this morning, my job, and I said, well, was there an answer to Baltimore? Can Baltimore be redeemed? I said, yep. And I said, but if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will they hear from heaven. And then will I heal the land. Baltimore can be redeemed, but Baltimore must first turn. Because if God heals it or if he delivers it before they turn, then his word can't be true. The healing is after the turning. Because, see, we want to keep walking in the opposite direction and experience healing. We want to do what we want to do and be healed. So, yes, and that's the answer for any situation. Is there an answer for the United States? Yes. But the United States has to what? Turn. We can end the war today. All the two competing countries have to do is turn. We can end world hunger today. All we got to do is what? Turn from our wicked ways. We're asking God when, and he's asking us when. When you going to heal or when you going to turn? It's almost like something that God has already put in motion, that the product of turning is healing. And you almost don't have to ask for it. You just turn. You repent. And, it autom and healing automatically is your portion. Because God's word said it. Does that make sense? It's almost automatic that he set it into the cold that when you turn to me, healing just happens. All right, so the doctrine of Christ. <laughs> Scripture reveals that the Lord Jesus is the eternal son of God. Here's the key, y'all, who always existed with the Father and the Holy Spirit and who by his incarnation took upon himself the form of a man and became the God-man. So Christ always what? Christ always what? Christ always existed. Was Christ created? Christ always was with God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. It was with him at all times. In its completeness and integrity. They are distinguishable, but they are inadvisable. So that he is fully man, and he is fully God. It is this sinless union of the divine and the human natures which qualifies him to be the only sacrificial mediator between God and man. One person. I'm going to put some time here. Jesus is one person, but he has two natures. He is fully God. Say fully God. He's all of God. And he's also 
fully man. Y'all, that's deep. It's going to get real good in a minute. But that is deep. That right there should just change your worship. Because it's really God. That really took all of who he was and put it in a body. And he named the carrier of himself Emmanuel. God with us. Here's the, the, the beautiful part about all of this. That same nature is now in us. We are seated with Christ. And so if we're seated with Christ, I'm seated with, thank you. If I'm seated with Christ, I am seated with God. Because Christ is fully and fully, now it makes sense where we really seated. You're seated with God. So the question is, do you understand yourself? Do you understand your nature? Because how can either greater works that I've done you would do if I'm not like him? I'm creating his image. I'm creating his likeness. So I kind of almost have to do what he did. Like we're not just humans. We're redeemed humans. With an eternal purpose. Created for the glory of God. That's what makes it easy in, in cases to resist. Because I understand who I am and I understand my nature. So things become more simple when I know who I am. And what we see now is the world full of inhabitants that don't know who they are. Because if we really knew who we were, that's the answer to all of this. That the answer is in you. The answer is in your genetic code. The answer is in what God put in you. That's the answer. That makes prayer easy. That makes healing easy. That makes looking Satan in his face and rebuking him easy. Because the nature of who God is, is in you. That makes you look at your situation and declare that it's going to get better, that it is already better. Because it's the, it's the God in you that's speaking to the situation. What a man believes about Jesus will determine how he relates to Christ. Or what a man believes about Jesus Christ will determine how you relate to Jesus Christ. If you don't understand that Jesus Christ is fully God, then you'll be disrespectful to him. If you don't understand that Jesus Christ is fully man, then you'll think that what he did was pointless. The two go together. So from henceforth and forevermore, when you see Jesus, when you hear the name Jesus, you got to automatically associate Jesus with being fully God and associate Jesus with being fully man. That even speaks to his willfulness, and I'm going to get to this in a minute, but it's, it, it also speaks to his willfulness to submit to God because he was God. That God put himself on a cross in his humanity. And he could have came down in his divinity. <laughs> but he willingly sacrificed his divinity. Yeah. 
He could have ended it all in every occurrence. But he didn't. He could have just looked at Satan and said, poof, be gone. But in his humanity, he said, it is written. In his humanity, he said, for man shall not live by bread alone. That was the humanity of him modeling for us how to respond. Well, he could have just said, I ain't doing this because I don't have to do this. In his deity, he could have said, I'm not doing it because I don't have to. He didn't have to carry a cross. He carried the cross in his humanity. Is it making sense? All right, so there are two major divisions of the doctrine of Christ. The first division is the person of Christ, who he is. We know two things about him now, that he is fully God and he is fully man. And then there's another component of Christ. It is the work of Christ, what he has done. So there are two components of Christ, who he is and what he has done. Who is Christ? Christ is fully God and he's fully man. What does the Bible say about Jesus who is fully, you fill in the blank. I'm going to keep saying it because it will help you with repetition. What does the Bible say about Jesus who is fully God and who is fully man? It says that Jesus is the eternal son of God. He's eternal. He has no ending. He has no beginning. He is and he was and he is to come and he will always be. He was born of a virgin. This floored me. I was like, whoa. He had to be born of a virgin. He could have not been born of man and woe man because uh, why? Because of the sin that is attached to everything that came out of Adam and Eve. And had he been born of man and woman, he would have sinned. So God was so mindful, God was so powerful, God was so intentional that he circumvented, that he went around the traditional way to create man and display his power. That you, in your dimension, you need man and woman to reproduce. I don't. So it was a really a display of his ma ma majesty. It was really a display of his power that I'll still create, and I don't need a man and a woman to do it. Sinless humanity, that the humanity of who he is was sinless, it means that Christ did not what? Sin. And here's the reality, y'all. People try to say that he did not sin because he was fully God. No, no, no. He did not sin because he chose not to sin. Because he could have sinned, but he did not. Because to say that he was fully God, which is why he didn't sin, it kind of denounces his humanity. Because in his humanity, he was like us. And he modeled for us what to do. He chose to tell Satan, for it is written. He chose to tell Satan that I cannot live, that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. He chose to do that. He died a vicarious death. The death of Jesus is important to everything that we believe, to everything that we believe. 
He came to die. He had to die. But why, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, but why did he have to die? He died in our place because who was supposed to die? Us. Because the wages of sin is what? Death. So Jesus paid the price. He died so we didn't have to die. He willingly died in his humanity so that we didn't have to die. It also speaks to the obligation that God has to his creation. It speaks to the depth of his love. That yes, you sin, but I'll send you a body. Yes, you sin, but I'll send myself. Because I am obligated to what I created. God is obligated to take care of you. Because you belong to him. Does that make sense? It is his obligation because you belong to him. Tasha has an obligation to her two children because she made them. Y'all have an obligation to Milan because you made her. Raylise has an obligation to her children because she made them. Now, because of sin and us being earthly, we don't always fulfill our obligation, but it doesn't remove the fact that you're still obligated. And nothing that ta uh, Tally can do will make Tasha not love her. Nothing. There is nothing that your daughter can do that can pluck her out of your hand. There is nothing Milan can do that's going to make you not love her. You may disagree with her actions, but a real parent will always love their children, regardless. You go to jail, I'm coming. I don't agree that you're there, but I'm going to put some money on your book. Because <laughs> you're my child. You make a bad grade, I ain't going to throw you out the house. I might put you on punishment because I love you, but I'm not going to stop loving you because you made a D. That's silly, that, right? Same way with God. I'm not going to not love you because you sin. I'm still going to clothe you with fig leaves. And I'm still going to say ain't nothing going to happen to you when I throw you out of the garden. And I'm going to be so just that I'll put a cherubim at the entrance of the garden to guide you back because I love you. That the consequence is out of my presence. But the, but, but the reality is the redempting part of it is that I will guide you back to the place. And if you remember, the only way past the cherubim at the entrance of the garden is that you be born again by water and what? Spirit. Because you can't crawl in your mother and be born again, but you got to be born again in the what? Spirit. So that when you go knocking at the entrance of the garden and you look like Jesus, he says, welcome. That's the only way back to what you used to be. It's through him. That's the beauty of our, our relationship. That's the beauty of our faith. Is that God don't see us. He sees himself. And when we stand before him, he doesn't see our sin because Christ paid the price for that. You understand what I'm saying? So he doesn't even see the sin. He sees himself. So he tells himself, welcome. He tells himself, come on up a little higher. The issue is when you stand before him and you're knocking and he don't see himself. And he sees something that's distorted. That's when he say, depart from me because you don't look like me. That's essentially what it means. Away from me, out of my presence because you don't look like me. And the only people that can dwell here is my image. So if you're not my image, you can't come. And if you're not in my image, you're separated from me. 
Hence, you go to hell. It's separation. It is eternal separation from God. That where you going, he ain't there. And if he ain't there, it's chaotic. Uh, the burial and the resurrection. He was made the perfect sacrifice for sin. He made redemption available for all men. Now, as you know, there are a lot of things that oppose the truth. And here it says, any belief or theory that is strongly at variance with the established belief or customs, in particular the accepted beliefs of a church or religious organizations. That I just told you who Jesus was, a part of what his purpose and his mission was. So there has to be a, a, an opposing voice because that's who Satan is. He opposes the truth. So during biblical times, during the formation of the early church, you had people preaching Jesus and you had people preaching things that were not Jesus. You had people questioning, you had people examining, you had people just doing whatever. That if God say right, go right, people were going left. Because that was Satan's job. Satan's job was to send them in the direction that God said not to go, essentially. So here are some beliefs that go against Jesus. The Ebionites, they denied Christ's deity. They said that Christ, and these were things that were going on in biblical times, and if you really look at it, it's still going on now. People are denying the deity of Christ. People are denying the fact that Christ was God. That he was just a man. That he was just another prophet. That he is not God. So much so that they didn't even realize that he was the Messiah. They were waiting on the Messiah. He was sitting in your kitchen. But you couldn't see his divinity. You only saw his humanity. And people still feel this way. And you're going to disciple people that does not believe that Jesus is God. And you have to have scriptural reference to point them back to the fact that what you're saying is true. There are more people than you know that believe that Jesus is not God. You have the Gnostics. They deny Christ's humanity. They believe that he was God and not human. See the variances? You got one group believing that he was not God, you got another group believing that he was not human. He's both. And there are still people that believe that he is not what? Human. Which is what allowed him not to sin. No, he chose not to sin. A lot of people say, I can't be like God because I ain't in my glorified body. But what was the point of redemption? You are a new creature. The Arians, they taught that Christ was a created being. Was Christ created? No, he always what? Was. He always existed with God. He wasn't created. Because if he was created, it almost deduces his ability. It brings him down a level. It put him on a level with us. Because we're created. He always existed. He's self-sufficient. He doesn't need the assistance to exist. The Apollinarians, they denied the completeness of Christ's human nature. The Nestotarians, the Nestotarians denied the union of the two natures in Christ, reducing him to a man filled with God. That you're not God, you just feel with him. You have the Etrians. They deny the distinction of the two natures of Christ, thus making a third or a hybrid nature of the two. Then you have the Monophysites. They deny the two natures and the wills in one person of Christ. So there are a lot of beliefs that you have to be able to refute. If you go back to the first slide, with the word of God. If Jesus Christ is not born virgin, uh, is not virgin born, he is not sinless. And if he is not sinless, then he himself needs a savior. Yeah. 
Imagine God needing to be saved. Well, what's the answer beyond you? <laughs> there is no answer beyond him. So he had to be born. Virgin born. He had to. There's no other way to do it. If he himself needs salvation, then he cannot be our savior, lord or king, and the entire redemptive plan falls powerless to the ground. Hence, we need to understand and believe the foundational significance of the incarnation. Now we're about to switch. Boom. Y'all ready? Incarnation. What does that mean? It means God taking on himself human flesh. Deity took upon humanity. That God in his power said that I will put myself in a body. Why? Why did he put himself in a body? Why did God put himself in a body? Because the only way to be redeemed is through death. You can't be redeemed unless the body dies. You can't go to God unless the old man is dead. Make sense? So he had to put himself in a body. Because God wasn't going to come in his spirit and die. It had to be a physical death because the wages of sin is death. So he put himself in a body and willingly told his body to die. Imagine God, the creator of all things, puts himself in a, in a body. I'm going to come down here, I'm going to do what I need to do, and I'm going to die. I control death, but yet I said die. Death is in my hand, yet I commanded myself to die. Imagine God commanding himself to die so we could live. I willed myself to die. I put divinity in a bottle. I put divinity in a body. And the sole purpose of this body was to die. Why was the incarnation necessary? Why was it necessary for God to put himself in a body? It was necessary for God to put himself in a body because of the fall and the sinfulness of man. It was necessary that God put himself in a body because of the covenant. The fact that God is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God means that as the creator, he is obligated for the creature. He made a covenant with man. He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Before man was created, he said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. The written Bible was just the product of what was already in the spirit. The Bible was already written before it was printed. Because it was him. So I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. So when you sin, I got to come see about you. Because my word is fulfilled already. It was just written in time, but it always existed in eternity. His word always existed in the spirit. It was just written in this dimension. It was already fulfilled before it was written. That's deep. That what you see in this dimension is just a product of what already was. So now through my relationship with Christ, I can call some things out of time into this dimension. Everything that you see was called out of eternity. And he spoke. What did he speak from? He spoke from a place of eternity. And God created. Where did he create from? He created from a space of eternity. He's eternal. It's 
So everything that we see, our senses were a product of eternity. And it already existed in him. Making earth wasn't a surprise. He always intended for us to have dominion with him. When man sinned, God was still obligated by his own will to man, especially in the realm of redemption. If man is to be redeemed, then he must die for man. Then a man must die for man. God could not redeem man as God. He had to become a man. Henceforth, Jesus. Imagine if he was not all-knowing. If God was not all-knowing, then Jesus would be created. If God was not all-knowing, then he would be coming up with the solution after Adam sinned. Adam sinned, God provides a solution if he was not all-knowing. But the fact that he is all-knowing, he provided the solution before he even created man. False concepts. He emptied himself of his deity. No, he did not because he is fully, and he is fully, he emptied himself of the possessions of divine attributes, self-existence, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscience. He knows all things. He's everywhere at all times. He did not empty himself of that to become man because he was fully God. So his deity suggests that he is self-existent. His deity suggests that he knows all things. His deity uh, suggests that he's everywhere at all times. His deity suggests that he's all-powerful. Proper concepts. These were the false concepts. So the proper concept is Christ was always God. That Christ always possessed the ability to know all things, to be at all places at all times, and to be all-powerful. Christ, as God, became a dependent man. When, what makes Christ dependent? If he's fully God, then what makes him dependent? Because God is self-sufficient, and God is self-existing, and God doesn't depend on anybody. So what made Christ dependent? What part of him made him depend on God? His humanity. His humanity says that now I depend on God. His deity says I'm self-sufficient. His humanity says I do the will of the Father. His deity says I am the Father. His body, his flesh says I follow God wherever I go. And I only say what he say. His deity says, I created what you're saying in your body. In one, in his deity, I am God. I am the word. In his flesh, I submit to God. And I submit to the word. Make sense? Y'all, God is bad. It was like an inverse relationship that he put in man. That when the deity rose, the humanity died. It's like he knew in his humanity that I got to submit my human part to my deity. So God was submitting to himself. I put myself in the body, then I submit to me. The son took upon himself the limitations of a perfect humanity and exercised a continuous surrender of his will. He exercised a continuous surrender of his what? Will. He exercised the surrendering of his will in his what? Humanity. He did not need to suffer. Y'all, this was powerful. The human part and the divine part did not need to suffer. It didn't need to hunger. It didn't need to thirst. It didn't need to grow weary. It didn't need to feel sorrowful. It didn't need to suffer. It didn't need to die. 
And here's the part. He never used his divinity to alleviate the infirmities of his human nature. He didn't have to suffer. He didn't have to be hungry. He didn't have to thirst. He didn't have to ask, is there a place to lay my head? He didn't have to ask. He could have just snapped his finger and made some pizza. In his deity, he didn't need to eat. Because you don't need physical food in the spirit. He needed physical food to feed his humanity. But he could have tapped into his divinity and said, body be full. He didn't have to be born in a manger. He chose to be born in a manger. In a low place. He didn't have to feel weariness. His divinity could have stepped into the body and said, don't be weary. But in his humanity, he felt all the feels. But he didn't have to feel anything. He chose to feel how we felt. In his self-emptying, he gave up the form of God and took upon himself the form of a servant without ceasing to be God. This is Christ as the God-dependent man. That his humanity needed God. So he emptied himself. He gave up the form of God and took upon himself the form of a what? Servant. In his humanity, he became a servant. But while he was serving, he didn't stop being God. He just chose to serve in his humanity. In his self-emptying, he taught only what the Father told him to what? Say. In his divinity, he could have said all he had to say in one breath. But in his humanity, he exercised what? Self-will. That I can say whatever I want to say because I wrote it. In my deity, I can do what I want to do. But in my humanity, I only say what he said. He was like back and forth. In my humanity, it is the will of God. In my deity, I am the will. In one person. In his self-emptying, he exercised only the authority the Father gave him. In his humanity, the only authority he exercised is what God gave him. In his divinity, he had all power. In his humanity, he hung. Because in his deity, he could have just annihilated them. He said, I'll call a legion of angels. And they ready to do my beck and the call. They singing, holy, holy, holy. What is the God that you need me to do? And all I got to do is say, come. But in my humanity, I will not call the legion of angels to take me off this cross. Because my purpose is to be on this cross. And I willed myself to hang here. Because I could have snapped my fingers and taken myself off. I didn't have to be buried. I was buried on purpose. But when I was buried, you buried my body. It was in my deity that I went to hell and got the keys. It was in my deity that I rose again. I raised myself. I let you kill me in my humanity, but I will raise myself in three days in my divinity. And in that three-day time span, I got a mission to do in my divinity. That I need to go and do a thing for 72 hours. But I'll be back. And in my deity, I will roll the stone away. Because I could have stopped you from putting it in front of it. But I let you do it in my humanity. I didn't have to let you wrap me in death in grave clothes. I let you wrap me in grave clothes. But I'll take them off in my deity. He bad. When you come looking for me, I won't be there because my deity is at work. My godliness is at work to show you that the only power you have is what I gave. 
In his self-emptying, he laid aside the independent exercise of his divine attribute, only exercising them as the Father will. Uh. All right, there we go. I'm going to go till we get to. All right, this is the last slide on the doctrine of Christ. It says, if we overemphasize his deity, we obscure his perfect humanity. If we overemphasize his humanity, we obscure his deity. If we deny his deity, then there is no contact between God and man, and the bridge is broken down from the divine side. On the other hand, if we deny his humanity, then the bridge is broken down on the human side. It is out of such imbalance that heresies have arisen concerning the blessed Son of God. Dr. Charles A. Ratz, in the person of Christ, quotes an old Latin inscription chiseled in marble found in Asia concerning the faith of Lord Jesus Christ in the first century of of Christianity. It reads, I am what was God. I am, I was not what I am, man. I am now called both God and man. Truly Christ as the God-man is the better mediator and the better covenant. We're going to go real quick through atonement. Y'all give me 10 minutes? Yes. All right. So atonement, real fast. What what is atonement? All right. Atonement means to be made at one, to reconcile, to bring about agreement or concord. To make amends or reparation for what? Wrongdoing. It encompasses all redemptive works. So atonement speaks to us being reconciled what? Back to God. Because atonement means that us being what? Back in right standing with God. Atonement means that we are in fellowship again with God. We are in agreement with God. Who was the atonement for us? Christ. The doctrine of atonement. The holiness of God. Yeah, this is deep. The holiness of God against the sinfulness of man produced the reaction of his divine wrath. It is this wrath that needed the appeasement before a holy God and sinful man could ever be reconciled. The atonement stops the wrath of God. Because God's word was already put in motion and the wages of sin is what? Death. But the atonement stops the what? Death and push you back in right standing with God. It is the atonement that allows him not to see your issues and your sin. The appeasement is the atonement. What appeases God to stop his wrath? Because his wrath comes forth for evil. What stops God from looking at us and seeing evil? The atonement. And who did that? Jesus. And how did he do it? He died. And he died to be the appeasement. He died to be the sweet fragrance. He died so that when God smells us, he smells himself. He died so that we don't experience God's wrath. And that separates us from every other religion. The person of Christ deals with who he is while the work of Christ deals with what he has done. He reconciled us back to God. Christ's death is absolutely a unique death. It is the only death that makes redemption possible. It was not the healings that he did. It wasn't him turning water into wine. It wasn't him parting the Red Sea. It it wasn't Jesus performing a miracle. It wasn't Jesus healing leprosy. It wasn't Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. It was Jesus dying. And we want his miracles, but we should glorify in his death. It is the death that st- it's the death of Christ that it stops the wrath of God from being my portion. He died to appease himself. The death of Christ was part of God's eternal purpose 
The death of Christ was the chief purpose of God putting himself in a body. God put himself in a body to die. That was the whole purpose. I put myself in a body to die. The death of Christ is the major theme of the gospel of what? Grace. The death of Christ is essential to Christianity. The death of Christ was for the whole world. We got to understand that. It is the death of Christ that appeases God. Not the miracle. Not his ability not to sin. Him being sinless was a piece of it. But the icing on the cake was his death. That's why he didn't stop him. No, I shall be crucified. I'll die. His humanity said, if it be thy will, pass this bitter cup from me. His divinity said, but not my will. As he's talking to himself. That himself said, pass this bitter cup. Then he thought about us. He thought about his purpose for putting himself in the body. Then he said, no, but I, I shall die. And he walked. The death of Christ is essential to our salvation. The death of Christ was a voluntary act. He voluntarily died. The death of Christ was necessary for the penalty of sin. The death of Christ was an accomplishment, not an accident. He didn't accidentally die. Y'all ain't accidentally killed the Messiah. He chose to die. He didn't have to. In his divinity, he could have stopped the death. But in his humanity, he said, you know what? I came for this purpose. The death of Christ was the conquest of Satan's kingdom. Satan has lost. Period. That should give a reaction. Satan has lost. He ain't win and he's not winning. He has lost. There is no win in Satan. And the only way we experience that is through Christ's death. The doctrine of atonement was a redemption. It was God, Christ was the ransom for us, and Christ was the substitution for us. He was the appeasement. He was the sweet fragrance of God. That God didn't smell sin when he smelt us. He smelt himself. In summary, this is my last slide. Here's the benefits of the atonement. Here are the benefits of the death of Christ. Here are the benefits of Christ being the appeasement for, our, for the wrath of God. Here are the benefits. In pardon, God is seen as a sovereign king who forgives the offender. We were offended, but he forgives us. He has pardoned us through the death of Christ. It's justification. God is the righteous judge, declares the pardon sinners righteous. He declares us righteous through the death of Christ. In regeneration, God the creator imparts a new and divine life and nature to the believer, thus bringing him into the family of God. He redeemed us back to what we were supposed to be. In adoption, God the Father places the believer as a privileged and responsible son in his family. He has adopted us back into his family. Sin took us out of his family. The death of Christ put us back in his family. In sanctification, God the Holy One, he sets the believer apart from all evil unto himself and to his holy service as a priest. You know you were a priest? Did you know that? Did you know that you hold a certain seat? You hold the seat of a priest. But you could not have held that seat without the atonement. In perfection, God, the sinless one, brings the believer into complete adjustment with himself and his will, eradicating the sin principle of self-will. That's a big one. In perfection, you can be spiritually mature 
because he died for you. That you can say no. Because in his, in his humanity, he said what? No. In glorification, God, the God of all glory, restores man to his original glory and purpose, which includes itself, in itself, creation and redemption. So that's our last slide. That's our last night in uh, the foundation of Christian doctrine. This is where we're going next week. Multiply by Francis Chan. It is designed for use in discipleship relationships and other focus settings. Multiply will equip you to carry out Jesus's ministry. So you know who Jesus is because of the doctrine of Jesus. He is fully God and what? Fully man. You understand the components of his humanity and the components of his deity and how he self-willed himself to submit to himself. And our literal response in this moment is to do the same thing. Like sin has no power over us. Sin may be your appetite because your focus is on that. Because it is the lust of our own desires that draws us from him. Sin don't control you. You just give it leeway. And it grows. And it's the growing of sin that makes us feel like we've gotten off. Because sometimes the consequences are not always immediate. That sin has to grow. Then it kills you. And we take the grace of God for granted. Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. Just because I died don't mean you just keep sinning just because I died. And because of what we know about him, this should force us to what? Say no. Y'all, our job is simple. Our job is real simple. And eventually, it'll become less of you resisting. Because the enemy will flee when you stop answering. When you stop responding, he won't bother you because he can't get you in that area. And then we can move on to other stuff. Versus, did you say no? Did you say no? That's very elementary of our faith. It's a lot of stuff we have to do. We got healed through Christ. We got to set free through Christ. We got to direct through Christ. We got to correct through Christ. We got to teach. We got to evangelize. We got to prophesy. We got to pastor. We have to go ye therefore. We can't keep spending time about did you tell yourself no. We have other things to talk about than resisting sin. That's very foundational and very basic. And God is drawing the line. The line has been drawn. The line always was drawn. And the Holy Spirit is going to convict everybody under the sound of my voice that chooses to continue in sin. And it's not my job to tell you because he's told you. And his ain't word ain't just for you, it's for me too. We cannot be lukewarm anymore. Choose ye this day. Who are you going to serve? It's just that simple. Because the Holy Spirit lives in us, we will temple. It's just certain things we can't say. It's certain things we can't do. It's certain places we can't go. We just can't. And we're not going to get it all right. We're not. That's why we're going to pray and ask for forgiveness, but we're not going to keep repeating the same thing. You understand what I'm saying? Because we have work to do. We have communities to disciple. And let me tell you this. The more you say no, the more powerful you feel. The more you resist your flesh, the more of God will show. And there's a boldness. That's why he said you can approach the throne of God boldly, because there's no shame in you no more, because you're not willingly sinning. So you can come to me boldly. Riley comes to me boldly when she's had a great day and she followed direction the first time they were given. But when she does not follow direction the first time it, it, uh, she's told to, there's a little condemnation. 
and there's a little head dragging when she's getting out of school. Now, I already know if you had a good day or not, if you follow direction, if you resisted temptation. If you resisted that voice that said, don't play in the center, when the teacher said, get out the center. Real simple. So I, hate, I, I teach her, follow directions the first time. I'm literally just teaching her to follow God's voice. The first time, if your teacher says no, it's no. If she says put it down, put it down. The first time. Make sense? So she approaches me boldly. Daddy, we going to Target today? Yeah, we can go to Target on Friday. But she also knows when she doesn't do what I'm asking her to do, we might not go to Target. Real simple. And as we move forward in discipleship, guys, it starts in your home with little stuff just like that. Tell your children that you have two voices, good and evil, and give them examples. Because the disobedience started in your house. Pick up the toys. I don't feel like it. Well, who are you talking to? You have to correct that immediately because you don't have an option to disobey my voice because I'm the father and you're the child. So when I say pick up the toys, it means do it immediately with the, with the urgency because the voice of authority told you to do it. It starts there. Dad has got to get back in the house. We, don't, we cannot afford to have daddyless homes because children don't know how to submit because they ain't had to. You don't know the love of God because you don't know the love of a father. And they go together. I don't want to submit to authority because daddy was just not there. I don't even see God as father because I didn't have one. So it starts there. It's real simple. And I'm not saying kumbaya and read 17 scriptures a night. Start small. How was your day in school? Did you do what you were supposed to do the first time? Get a little chart with Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And let them get four out of five, three out of five, depending on how bad your child is, one out of five. <laughs> if you get one sticker, you go to Dollar Tree. Because you're teaching them to obey. If you get three stickers, we go on the Dollar Tree. If you get four stickers, whatever the reward is. See what I'm saying, how simple that is? It's just an incentive chart. But you're teaching them to obey. Simple stuff. Pick up the socks. Stop giving them options. It's one option, what I said. Because with God, it's one option. And what's the option? What he said. You cannot pacify that spirit in your kid. I'm telling you, it starts with a sock. I will lose my mind over Riley not picking up a sock because I said pick up the sock. Because you look up, that turns into no, daddy. And then no, daddy turns into why my kid got all F's. Then all else turns into, why my kid got expelled? Then expel is, why my kid go to jail? Because they lawless. Because you let them be. Katie and I can't disciple y'all kids. The teachers can't do it. And most of the time, they ain't teaching Jesus anyway. We raising kids. We raise children all day. It's exhausting. Because you ain't going to have no teacher in 15 years. It is the start of lawlessness. Because there is no instruction. Just saying. All right, I'm done. For real, y'all. It's... <laughs> All right, we'll pray out. So, Father God, we thank you again, God, for another opportunity, Father, to learn more, God, of you. 
Father, I pray that um, the information that we've learned, God, does not fall on deaf ears, God, that we will actually apply this information, God, so that we could be better Christ followers. God, it is indeed an honor and a privilege. And forgive us, God, for taking um, who you are for granted. Forgive us, O oh God, for taking your spirit that you've placed in us as temples of your Holy Spirit for granted. Forgive us, God, for not listening to your voice, for deducing you, God, for making you, for taking you, God, out of your rightful place. And now, God, I pray for a conviction, Father, that will rock us until we respond. In those moments, God, where we are faced with temptation, God, I pray that we will continue to choose you. That we will continue to say yes, oh God, to your will. Because we can do that because Jesus did that in his humanity. May we always remember, God, that we have a force fighting with us. And that you are on our side. And that we are more than conquerors. And God, one day we're going to move past this place of, did I answer or did I say yes? Because it'll become a part of our nature to just respond and say yes every time. We will be like Jesus so that we can move forward to the more spiritually mature things that you have asked us to do. Help us, God, on this journey. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to give, guys, the, uh, the offering basket is located here. Give as God gave.